Welcome to the Full Story series, where we take a lot of our older videos and combine them together to tell a linear, cohesive storyline, allowing you to get a better grasp because some of our playlists don't make any sense anymore. Today, we're gonna to be doing the origins all the way to the, what I consider the finale of X-23, where she finally accepts who she is and who her father is. So I hope you guys enjoy the storyline of X-23. Our story begins with Wolverine breaking free of the experiments conducted on him. You see, Wolverine is a mutant that can heal from any injury, and because of this, some scientists thought it would be a good idea to experiment on him and find a way to harness this power into a weapon for use by people who do that kind of thing. Well, Wolverine got free, and on his way out he murdered everyone in his path. But the one important individual for our story is a scientist named Dr. Rice. Wolverine murdered him, and then he left. His son Xander received the terrible news of his father's death from Martin, one of the heads of the program. And then, Xander devoted his life to science, so that he could eventually avenge his father's death. So he tried everything that he could think of to create a new weapon for Martin. But it all failed, until one day. Martin brought in Dr. Sarah Kinney, and she proposed cloning the original DNA from the original mutant, Wolverine, and recreating him. She wanted to test her cloning technology, and Martin's organization would provide endless resources and money. It would also provide no moral oversight. So the experiments began as she tried to recreate everything that she could. Every enzyme, every codon, every sequence recreated from the little genetic material that they had remaining from Wolverine. But it was too damaged, and she couldn't recover the Y chromosome. So she suggested that they just use two X chromosomes and they make the clone a female. Well, originally they turned her down because they wanted an exact clone of Wolverine. That's what they were paying for. So Sarah went back to the lab to continue her research while secretly starting the female clone of Wolverine. It worked and the subject began to grow and she told herself she was making a weapon, not a life, not a child. Once the egg was ready to be placed into a surrogate mother, she told Martin and Xander what she had done. While they weren't happy, Martin did order Xander to find a surrogate as soon as possible. But Xander was more twisted and demented than anyone could have imagined. He was also not a fan of having Sarah here because she was ruining his research. So he waited until the last possible second, and then he approached Sarah saying that she was the only possible surrogate. If she didn't agree to come and do it right now, she would lose the egg, and the clone would be lost. So she didn't have a choice and she became the unwilling mother of a weapon that was to be born. She was placed into the experiment, constantly monitored and experimented on herself. But the whole time, she tried to treat it like a baby. Until the day that X-23 was born, a living female clone of Wolverine. Right away they began training her and they were using methods to strip her of her own humanity. But Sarah tried her best to fight for the child and give her some kind of a life. Martin and Xander refused as they had paid a large amount of money for this weapon and they were going to see it change into the best weapon it could possibly be. So the training continued regardless of what Sarah was trying to do and X-23 spent a lot of time with her teachers and her sensei. As she grew, Xander grew to hate everything about X-23. This was a clone of the man that took his father from him. He was so removed from reality and any sense of morals at this point that he began to sleep with Martin's wife. When she told Xander that she was pregnant with his child, Xander just shrugged it off and told her to tell Martin that it was his. With all of this training going on, Sarah would try to sneak in and read X-23 bedtime stories by slipping in pages of Pinocchio into the pages of Art of War, so no one knew she was doing it. But eventually, Xander and Martin got tired of waiting for her to gain her mutation. And so they decided to try and force X-23 to gain it one day. So, against Sarah's pleas, they stuck X-23 into a radiation bath to force her mutation to start. She nearly died with Sarah calling out for her daughter. But Xander was right, and X-23 gained her claws and her healing abilities. This led to the next stage of Xander's torture for the clone, and he tied her down, and without any painkillers, he removed her claws forcibly and laced them with the adamantium. But that wasn't enough for Xander because she survived. 
So his next plan to torment the poor young girl came when he laced her sensei's sword with a trigger that they invented. This trigger would send her into an uncontrollable killing frenzy. And with this trigger on the sword, it forced her to murder the only person who actually treated her like a human. She was heartbroken that day, and one of the last pieces of her humanity died with him. A few years passed and X-23's training finally came to an end. They started sending her out to kill targets, the ultimate killer. No one ever expected this young girl to come in and murder people. So, she killed royalty, godfathers, drug lords, dictators, assassins, anyone and everyone for the right price. She was perfect and Xander couldn't take it anymore. So one day he decided to go on a mission with her. The entire purpose was to leave her there to die, let the little clone rot by itself. Once she was set off, he killed the crew on board of the helicopter and they sent out a distress call. He claimed that they took shots and they needed to leave X-23 behind. They had no option. He would have gotten away with it too, if it wasn't for the fact that this was X-23 and she just walked back to the facility one day. Shocked, Xander claimed that he had no idea how she got back there. So things went back to normal. Well, as normal as they could get. Sarah tried more often to give X-23 her humanity, and Xander got more and more twisted in X-23. Well, she just continued to wall off the world around her. All of the stress on Martin eventually started to get to him, so Xander made him an offer. Let me take over the project. He always considered Martin a father figure, and he feels that he could take this project to the next level, and take the stress away from Martin and his family. Not realizing that this was all some evil plot to take over the company, Martin went through with signing the makeshift document giving Xander all of the rights to the project. And he thanked Xander for being a caring friend. Once Martin was out of sight, Xander didn't waste any time going to his trunk where he was hiding X-23, and he gave her her new target, Martin and his family. She went inside and she murdered everyone as she was ordered to. Well, that is until she got to the child, and she saw a scared little boy. X-23 then set the building on fire as she left and she reported back to the facility where she was washed up like an animal by Xander and thrown back into her cell. Once everyone walked away, Sarah looked into the cell to see X-23 cutting herself and shocked and appalled by this, she ran into the cell to ask her, why are you doing this? She thought it was Xander making those marks on her arm. And it was while trying to figure this out that she got the news about Martin and his family dying. So as Sarah was trying to go get the full story, X-23 stopped her and opened her mouth. In it was a photo of Martin and his family. Sarah finally realized how far this had gone and that she needed to save X-23 before it was too late. Xander and I both used you. We're both monsters. But I'm getting you out of here, Sarah told her. And for the first time in years, X-23 turned to her. A mission? And with tears welling up in her eyes, Sarah told her, yes, a mission. So Sarah set up a mission envelope that contained a key to X-23's cell and the objective, kill Xander. And then she slipped it underneath the door to X-23's cell. She couldn't be stopped and she ran through the entire facility in a blind rage, murdering everyone in there. And eventually she confronted Xander in his room. She started by slicing his gun's muzzle off and then pummeling him because she remembered everything that he did to her, calling her an animal, torturing her for his father's death and his attempts to kill her. And after finishing him off finally, her next objective was to go outside and meet Sarah. Sarah planned to give X-23 the life that she deserved finally. She was going to have a normal life. There were finally going to be a little girl with her mother that cared about her. And when X-23 walked out of the facility, Sarah looked at her daughter and she smiled. But Xander had one final trick up his sleeve. He rubbed the trigger that would send X-23 into a blind rage onto Sarah the night before this whole thing started. He had planned to have X-23 kill Sarah before they enacted their own plan to kill Xander. So, as X-23's eyes went red with rage one final time, she leaped onto Sarah, stabbing her repeatedly. And as Sarah lie there, bleeding out, X-23 came to her senses again as she realized what she had just done. Laura, your name is Laura, not X-23. My Laura. Sarah told her in her struggled breaths. Laura held Sarah's hand. No, please no. And as Sarah died, she finally got to say, I love you. 
And that was it. Laura curled up next to Sarah, just asking, Please don't leave me. Sarah was holding a packet for Laura at their rendezvous, and in it contained the information of the man that she was cloned from. His name was Wolverine, and he worked with the X-Men. So Laura started her own journey at that point. She is the clone of Wolverine that was trained to be a killer. She is the girl that was treated like a thing and not a young woman. She is the girl that was tricked into killing her own mother, Sarah Kinney, as her mother tried to save her. And at age 13, she now sits on the snow next to her mother, the mother that she killed. She couldn't even mourn properly as a helicopter was fast approaching. So she grabbed the duffel bag and the paperwork that her mother had and she ran into the nearby forest. She is a trained assassin, so the normal soldiers that came looking for her weren't a problem. She dropped them rather quickly and effectively. But that's when Kimura got her with an arrow, in the arm and in the legs. Come on, 23. You know you can't get away from me. So X-23 grabs Kimura's gun and fires a round into the mountains, burying the two of them in an avalanche. X-23 fled the area and she went to the only place that she knew away from the facility. Sarah's sister's house. She was there once before when Sarah needed X-23's expertise to rescue her cousin Megan. Megan had been told to not talk about the abduction, because if anyone knew that she was kidnapped and returned by X-23, the facility would have come and killed the whole family. This led to Megan thinking that she was crazy and thinking that no one would understand her. But X-23 told her the truth. She saved her when they were both younger, and she killed Megan's abductor. But we need to go to the end of this tale, to X-23 sitting in a chair with two individuals asking, who is she? Captain America and Matt Murdock want to know. What is X-23? Captain America had first been on X-23's track when she pretended to be a handicapped girl and murdered a senator's family and then the other 27 people there. But they want to know, where did Megan and her mother go? So X-23 continues her story. Megan ran downstairs to tell her mother what X-23 told her. And of course, X-23 denied saying it. After taking some of Megan's old clothes to fit in better, Laura followed Megan and told her that the reason she couldn't admit to filling her in, she can't ever let anyone know that she was here before or is here now. But she wanted Megan to know that she wasn't crazy. Laura then showed Megan her claws and explained that this was all to keep Megan and her mother safe. So they went back to school, where Laura's lack of understanding the social norms got her into trouble with two teachers and then suspended for yelling back at the principal. So the girls stole a car and they headed off into the city for some much needed R&R. Museums, movies, roller coasters, a pet shop, and a jewelry store. They even had time to go to Dazzler's concert. Then, as the sun set, they sat down on the docks and Laura revealed what happened to her mother. That the people who turned her into a killer also trained her to react to a certain scent. A scent that makes her black out. It was poured onto her own mother's neck, so they forced her to kill her. But as Laura explained to Captain America and Matt Murdock, the facility had already found her, she just didn't know, and they were planning to use that exact same trigger to force her to kill Megan. Desmond Alexander, Debbie's boyfriend, was actually a facility agent, and he was trying to put the trigger scent into some tea to give the Debbie and Megan. But as Megan entered the house, she swung the door open and into Desmond, and he spilled the tea on himself. He begins to yell at Megan, Oh my God, Megan, where's X-23? Where is she? And Megan pauses. How do you know that name? But Megan doesn't even have time to get an answer because Laura is standing in the doorway, claws drawn. Captain America stops her right there. Did you kill Megan and Debbie? But Matt interjects. You heard what she said. The trigger forces her to act and she is therefore acting under the influence of a controlling substance. She can't be held responsible, Steve. I heard what she said, Matt, but that doesn't mean someone isn't responsible for these deaths. All right, so what happened after the poison tea was spilled? Laura ran into the house and she tackled Desmond, clawing him right down his back. But all the noise forced Debbie to spill her own tea onto herself. Megan began to scream for Laura to stop. Please stop! But then she remembered what Laura told her about the trigger scent and about her blacking out during the attacks. So Megan ran upstairs and she got her mother and the two of them ran into the bathroom. They jumped into the shower and began to run as much water on them as they could, but it wasn't working. Laura sliced through the doorway and she came in swinging ready to kill them both. But just as she was ready to take that fateful swing, the scent was washed off and she went back to normal. But the facility wasn't done with her. They sent in backup in the form of Kamara. But Captain America stops her again. This is the second time that you've mentioned Kamara. Who is this? Laura explains that Kamara was her handler. 
and she was enhanced to have skin so tough that not even Laura could harm her. She was the one who would punish Laura when she misbehaved in the facility. So Laura ran Debbie and Megan into the basement where she cut open a water pipe and let the freezing water run on the two of them. Then as the facility entered the house using heat vision goggles, Laura ran upstairs and took out each of them until only Kamara remained. But that's the problem because Kamara was built specifically to counter everything Laura can do, and she disables her quickly, and then handcuffs herself to Laura and drags her down into the basement. She intends to kill Megan and Debbie in front of her to teach her a lesson, and then she threatened and tortured Laura with her taunts. But eventually, she left Laura with no other option. Allow Kamara to kill Megan, or kill Megan herself, and spare her the suffering. Matt Murdock stopped her there. So you killed Megan? No, Laura tells him. I cut my hand off. She then attached the handcuffs to the water main and left the building with both Debbie and Megan. With Kamara screaming that she'll get her revenge while handcuffed to the water main, Laura rigged the whole building to explode and walked away as it did. All three of them drove off until eventually they got far enough that Debbie felt she could stop to tell Laura that she made Sarah, her mother, very happy. When they came to visit her that one time, she could tell that Sarah was happy. She saved her mother from a destructive path and now she saved Megan and Debbie. She saved this whole family. And Debbie wanted to thank Laura for that. But Laura knew she had to leave Debbie and Megan. The facility would keep hunting her, and she didn't want them in harm's way again. So she left them. Debbie understood, but Megan, she didn't. On her own again, Laura had one option, to find the man who started all of this, her father, if you will, the killer that she was cloned from. She went to the Xavier Institute, and she stalked Wolverine for days, until eventually, Wolverine got a sniff of her, and he left. He went out to the Canadian border, and he waited, for Laura to jump him. He told her that she didn't need to do this. It didn't have to be this way. But Laura was determined as she forced Wolverine to pull his claws out. But he still refused to hurt her. He wanted to help. Sarah had sent Wolverine a copy of the letter that she had wrote for Laura, the one that explained everything. Wolverine knew about Laura and he knew what had been done to her. And when he went to the facility looking for her, she had already left. With Laura on top of him, ready to try and kill them both, Wolverine told her, if you want to kill me, go ahead but I won't let you kill yourself. No, she screamed, we both have to die. Maybe I do, you don't. You didn't choose this life. There's nothing you could have done to stop what happened. No, I have to die, it has to be stopped. They made me kill my mother. And Wolverine quietly told Laura that he was sorry. So with the battle over, they sat around the fire and Wolverine gave Laura the letter that Sarah gave to him. The letter explained that Sarah wanted a normal life for her daughter and that she was sorry for everything that had happened to her and that everything that did happen wasn't Laura's fault. Wolverine told Laura that things won't be easy, that he wants her to come back to the Xavier Institute. He can try and help her, and he knows a guy that can also help, a bald guy that can read her mind. And she told him, they'll come for me, even at the Institute. Darlin, they try and take you from there, and they're gonna be asking for a world of hurt. But before they could talk anymore, the helicopters began to approach, and Laura begins to panic because it's the facility. But Wolverine tells her, no, this is worse. This is the good guys. It was Captain America coming in to pick her up for all of the murders that she committed. And then he called Daredevil to act in the role of Matt Murdock and be the lawyer for this. And now, we've come to the end of her story. Matt tells Steve that he should have left her with Wolverine, that it was her best shot at a normal life. Sarah's letter is a written confession for all of the crimes committed and it absolves Laura for every crime. But Steve doesn't care. Someone needs to answer for what happened and I'm gonna bring her to S.H.I.E.L.D. Steve, everyone you're after is dead. If you bring her to S.H.I.E.L.D., they'll use her for what the facility wanted, a weapon. But Steve doesn't care and he takes Laura with him. And as they leave, Matt asks Steve to please don't do this. They can still fix it. Captain America doesn't get very far before he realizes what he's doing. So he had a change of heart and he dropped Laura off at a bus station with the ticket back to New York. He told her that he was sorry and that this is what she needed to go back to Wolverine. He's the only one that can help her at this point. So Laura got back onto the bus and with tears running down her eyes, she finally gets to read the final words of her mother for herself.
Things begin with Laura taking bullets into her back. There's a sniper on the Eiffel Tower. And as she looks up at the tower, she takes a shot to the head, knocking her out. She wakes up shortly, allowing her brain to knit itself back together because she has the healing factor of the original Wolverine. As a matter of fact, she is a clone with the claws and temperament to boot. She drops her raincoat, throws on her mask, and decides that it's time for the Wolverine to go up the tower and say hello. She gets up the tower and is welcomed by the sniper opening fire on her as she cuts off the tip of the gun. They go back and forth with Laura asking her to stop, but the assassin tells her that she should be helping them. Laura takes the assassin's arm and breaks it. Doesn't that hurt? Nothing hurts. The French police arrive, pointing their guns at everyone, and the assassin leaps off the tower to her death. So Laura follows up the side of the tower, counting as she goes. One, two, three, and nothing happens. I said three! Any time now! Angel comes swooping in to pick her up. I thought you weren't coming there for a second, Angel. Just counting to three when I don't know exactly where you are and gravity is involved is a bad idea, Laura. He flies her over to the airship and she tells him to get the civilians out of the way while he drops her on the back of the ship. Using the claws in her hands and feet, she holds on tight and then she starts to tear apart the plane's guts. The whole plane comes barreling down onto the streets, blowing up, and Laura bounces away from the wreckage. Angel flies over, watching her pop her bones back into place, and she starts stops him. Wait, don't hug me. I have six broken ribs, a dislocated shoulder, and third degree burns all over. Anything with a Titan brace is going to hurt. Is there anything I can do in the meantime? Anything that doesn't involve Titan braces. So Angel pats her on the head. Are you patting me on the head? A little awkward? A little awkward. I didn't say stop. Once she heals, Angel carries her over to where all of the civilians are taking pictures of the dead assassin. Laura removes her mask and sees herself, a version of her that couldn't feel pain. So Angel picks her up and they take off into the skies. She goes to the Alchemex facility to meet with the director of Alchemex. It was her son that she was saving from the assassin originally. And Captain Mooney, the head of Alchemex's covert operations, explains that these individuals have been targeting Alchemex facilities and acts of terrorism. This group has been trained as an advanced security team trained to protect diplomats and humanitarian organizations, but they became twisted and turned against the company. And now, they are killing everyone connected to the company. Laura wants to know the obvious question, why do they look like her? And the director explains that they are her clones. His predecessor acquired her DNA and tried to make more of her, but they don't have her healing factor or her style of claws, or her conscience. Laura looks at him. I will find them and make them stop, and I will do what's right. As she leaves though, the order to follow her is given. She is aware of it, and she scares off the people tailing her before Angel flies her up to Logan's old apartment that she now owns. She asks Angel to leave, and then she turns around to the clone of her. The clone asks if Laura killed her sister, and Laura tells her no. Then she looks at Laura while digging around her fridge. They're going to kill us. I don't want my sisters to die. It was you that led me to Paris, wasn't it? Yeah, I guess I hoped. We're your clones. You know what it's like to be used. You should be helping us. I won't help you kill. They took away pain and feelings from us. Don't hunt us, help us. Then Laura begins to smell smoke. She runs into her bedroom to find a fire on a plate on her bed. When she comes back out into the living room, the girl is gone. But Laura is the Wolverine, and tracking is her game. She follows the girl to the rest of the clones, and all of them point their guns at her. She holds her hands in the air. It's okay, I just want to. And then one of them shoots her in the stomach, and then over and over. Laura wakes up tied to a chair with the girl called Bellona holding a knife to her. They tell Laura that they want to talk, and Laura tells them that she wanted to before they shot her. They try to explain that it's not them. They didn't do the explosion, and there's more to this going on than she has seen. Laura tells them, quiet, she needs to be untied. People are coming. Captain Mooney and his troops all appear on the walkway above them. Captain Mooney, I was talking to them. Give me a chance to work this out, Laura asks. And he tells the soldiers to shoot the clones. An all-out brawl begins with all four of the girls jumping in and cutting up the soldiers with claws and knives until eventually they are all down and Bologna has a gun to Mooney's head. Bologna tells Laura that this one was their jailer for years. And Laura pleads with her not to do it. No more people need to die. Suddenly, she takes a bullet to the head and then all of the other clones take hits because Taskmaster is standing there. He kneels over the troops and he reports in that they've all been handled non-lethally, though they'll be a little sore at the way Wolverine treated them. Then Laura pulls out her claws and Taskmaster stops. Uh, I'll have to get back to you. I was only hired to bring in these three. Not really interested in you. Laura isn't listening. The rage has taken over as she bounds in to fight him. But this is Taskmaster and his power is to adapt and mimic any move that you use on him, allowing him to counter anything that she throws at him. Until he catches a kick and she pops her claw in her foot, stabbing his hand. Then she hits him and beats him down, knocking him out. The three girls get up, telling Laura that that was badass, and then they show her their body armor that protected them. Bologna wants to kill Taskmaster because he'll chase them, but Laura won't let her do it. So another of the girls shoots Taskmaster in the kneecaps, while Gabby, the youngest, is putting a man's fingers next to him just in case he plays the piano. They all load up into the girl's car and they head off, but quickly the Alchemex guys get on their tails again. Laura realizes what's going on. In the lab, Mooney cut her to check if it was the real her, and they put a tracker in her. 
Mooney then opens fire with armor piercing rounds shredding the Humvee. Laura tells them to stay in the Humvee, they have holes in them from the bullets. She jumps out of the Humvee into Mooney's, smashing the windshield, and then she tears off the steering wheel and jumps out of the car, stopping her slide with her claws. Mooney's Humvee plows into a telephone pole, totaling it. Mooney then pulls himself out of the wreckage and Laura walks over. If you or Alchemex Genetics comes after them again, I won't hold back. I've already beaten you unconscious once today and now I'm leaving you in the wreckage of a car alone and bleeding. That's me holding back. She walks over to the girls to see that Zelda's laid out and Laura asks if she's gonna be okay. But Zelda tells her she wasn't injured, she's dying. And Bellona finishes the sentence, we all are. Alchemex took away their pain, but they also took away years from the girls. And Laura has an idea to fully understand the situation, but she warns them things are about to get weird. She takes them to see Doctor Strange. He appears before them asking, what could Wolverine want with Doctor Strange? She tells him that she doesn't need the Strange, she needs the Doctor. He takes them inside where the cupboard winks at Bellona and Gabby is amazed that it's raining outside one window, but not the other. Before Strange is willing to help though, he decides that he needs to look into the souls of the girls. Gabby has seen much evil, but she is innocent and fundamentally good. Zelda, not so good. And Bellona doesn't like Strange judging her and is thinking of creative ways to murder him. Laura tells him, see, two out of three isn't bad. So Strange pulls her aside. Are you sure you want to help these girls? She tells him that she has done a lot of bad things, but there's always a chance for salvation. That's when they both hear blam, blam, blam back in the main room. And they enter to see the cupboard glowing and opening and Bologna said that it winked at her again. Strange tells them that they have broken the seal and to stand back and at that moment a giant monster pours out of it and it runs into the streets. Strange hands Wolverine his axe to use and he informs her it's an axe with a pointy end. You'll know what to do. She begins slicing through the monster's limbs with ease as the girls all get the civilians to safety. While they do successfully beat the monster, after the fight is over, Zelda is laid out on the ground across the street. So Strange takes her and teleports everyone to the nearby hospital where he hits her with some scans and discovers what's actually going on. They discover that there are nanites inside of the girls killing them. They are far too small and numerous for him to operate on. But he has another idea. Science. He teleports them all to Hank Pym's old lab to get the Ant-Man suit. And that's when Janet Van Dyne grows in front of them demanding to know what's going on. Laura explains that Strange teleported them all in to get the Ant-Man suit in battle against nanites. So Janet calls up Strange. You have my number. The next time you want to teleport desperate armed people onto my property, you call ahead. It may not sound like Sorcerer Supreme, but it's common courtesy, Steven. But Janet isn't a monster, so she gives Laura the suit and the two of them shrink down and they enter Zelda's bloodstream. Going the brute force method, Laura does what a Wolverine does best and claws up all of the nanites that she can find. With her muscles constantly repairing, she doesn't even need to stop. But eventually, Zelda stands feeling better. She wants to know what's going on and Bellona tells her that it's a little hard to explain. So Gabby tries. Teeny tiny warrior women are fighting for your life against teeny tiny robots in your body. Then the windows begin to crack and Zelda sees blood on her stomach. Then she says the one thing that we never thought these girls would say. It hurts. An explosion rocks the lab and Mooney walks in telling the girls that they should have stayed in their cages. Then, as Gabby headbutts him, he throws her aside. Zelda stumbles over to him ready to fight and he shoots her again, happy that he could hurt her finally. In the pool of blood on the ground, Laura comes jumping out of Zelda, grows and slices up Mooney. Then Janet gets behind him, shocking his head with her wasp stings. Mooney hits the ground when everyone runs to Zelda's side. Gabby can't help but say, no, 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 over and over. But we saved you. Yeah, you did, Zelda tells her. Then when Laura gets over to her, she tells her, I know what you were trying to do, but fight it. Whatever is stopping you from unleashing, fight it, hurt them. They need to understand that they can bring us into this world, but they can't own us. And then Zelda dies. Janet tells Wolverine that she'll take Mooney in and that they need to get these nanites out of the other girls. But Wolverine tells her, the nanites aren't killing them yet. And what happens next, they need not to feel. We're gonna go teach Alchemex a lesson. The next day, Mooney managed to take a car and drive it to the hidden base of Alchemex. He walked in and he told them that he had no idea how he got away, but he woke up and stole the car. But Mr. Chandler knows the truth. Wolverine let him go and she's hunting him. Laura, Bologna, and Gabby are all outside and they start shooting up the guards until Bologna runs ahead of everyone to take out more. She's instantly shot up and killed. Realizing that they are overwhelmed, Laura grabs Gabby and begins running back for cover. But once they get the body inside, they discover something odd. Bologna's hair isn't actually her hair. It's a wig, and that's when Laura wakes up from healing and pops both her claws. She threatens to murder the scientists unless they release all of the information out to the address that she provided. And then she walks out the front door, opening it. Bologna and Gabby walk in, and Laura and Bologna change their clothes back as Laura calls up Maria Hill of S.H.I.E.L.D. to inform her of the secret base with the experiments. Maria wants to know who this is. Only eight people have this number and one of them is dead. And Laura tells her the dead one gave it to her. Bologna and Gabby run off and they start beating on Mooney who doesn't even put up much of a fight this time. And that's when Bologna shoots him twice in the head. She walks out to inform Gabby that she has to go. This is goodbye. And Gabby asks her if she'll see Bologna again. Bologna holds her close telling her, once you grow up, look in the mirror. 
Laura walks in to find Mr. Chandler trying to make a break for it, so she slices his hamstring, keeping him from going anywhere. And once Gabby comes in, Laura says that they should go before S.H.I.E.L.D. gets there, but Gabby asks for a moment alone with Mr. Chandler. Laura leaves the room and Gabby pulls out her claw, telling Mr. Chandler that regardless of what they tried to do to her, she still wants to be a good person. She then stabs the ground in front of him, telling him this is how close he came. Bye! As they leave, Laura asks Gabby if she killed him. She tells her no. You're the worst at what they wanted you to do, Gabby. And that's pretty impressive. They leave the base for S.H.I.E.L.D. to clean up, and that's when Bologna is on a helicopter, and the person across from her tells her, I held up my end of the bargain. I broke you out, and I helped you get your revenge. Now I want those nanites out of your body. The person across from her is Kamara, the woman that tortured Laura back when she was a weapon herself. Her handler. Logan is riding down the highway in the rain, when out of nowhere, he sees Laura in front of him. Are you crazy? Go back to the Institute. It's not my home, Logan. I can smell their fear of me. And then she eyeballed him. I trust you. Yeah, and you can't come with me. People get hurt around me. People get hurt around me too, Logan. I know, and that's what I'm trying to change, kid. He parks his bike and he hops off. Look, we don't get to play happy family. I don't get to have a 9 to 5 job with a picket fence, and I don't get to make you sandwiches. Because I'm Wolverine. I attract violence and insanity. And not just the normal kind of insanity. The kind where Galactus shows up to step on our picket fence. And our sandwiches, actually. He has a foot that encompasses both the fence and the sandwiches. The rain begins to come down even harder, and Laura looks at him. Please don't leave me. And Logan looks away, and he gets back on his motorcycle. Trust me, I won't be gone forever. That's when Laura wakes up. It's been a while since that night, and a lot has happened. Logan eventually passed on, and she took on the mantle of Wolverine to carry on for her father. But what woke her up out of that dream was a growling noise. She snicked out her claws, and she walked over to the doorway, where she opens it and sees... Squirrel Girl in a growling Wolverine. Squirrel Girl is super excited to see Wolverine, and then she lets the live Wolverine go in her apartment. It runs into the house and into one of the other rooms, where Gabby, a clone of Laura, finds it and cuddles it hard. Squirrel Girl brought the Wolverine because she thought it could relay their situation a little bit better than she could herself. But Laura tells her that you know she can't talk to Wolverines, right? So Squirrel Girl ends up relaying the message herself. Laura has wronged the Squirrel World. She explains that when Laura was out running after some men, they crashed into a tree, and then she put the trap that they had put on her onto a squirrel. Well, they took the squirrel and separated a father from his family. So Laura suits up as Wolverine and they head off on their adventure. But as they're leaving, Gabby really wants to go along. She can't wait to go on an adventure. And Laura tells her that she needs to stay. She needs to lead a normal life. None of this craziness. Gabby looks down and she tells Laura that Laura's the only person that Gabby has left. Please don't leave me. Those words do strike a chord in Laura, but they do head off into the city where they find the tree that she damaged and a very angry squirrel family. One of the squirrels gives Laura an acorn and she uses that scent to chase after the father squirrel. When they get to the building with the apartments, Squirrel Girl jumps over the night guard, stealing his key card before returning it back to Wolverine. Laura tells her that she did really good back there, and Squirrel Girl can't hold it in anymore. She just got a compliment from Wolverine! So she asks for a selfie, but Laura has to put the mask on. They walk deeper into the apartment building, and at the doorway where the squirrel is being kept, Laura knocks. A man answers, asking who they are, and she tells him Wolverine. The kid behind the man perks up. Wolverine? Oh, you're a girl. So Laura barges in, goes into the kid's room, and finds the squirrel in a shoebox. They bring the father back to his family, and the daughter squirrel jumps up on Squirrel Girl's shoulder to translate something to Laura. I want you to know that your actions caused us a lot of pain. We lost our home, and I almost lost my father. However, I know that what you did was done without malice. Whatever pain you caused in the past wasn't your fault. I forgive you. There is nothing more important than family, and you have brought us together. Squirrel Girl turns to the squirrel. Wow, elegant squirrel! Laura smiles and thanks the squirrel before leaving. As she leaves, the squirrel asks Squirrel Girl if she translated or not, and Squirrel Girl told her, No, I told her what she needed to hear. So you didn't translate anything I said to you? Nope. Laura sneaks back into her house to see Gabby sitting there with Jonathan the Wolverine. Yes, they named the Wolverine Jonathan. Gabby asked if Laura found a way to get rid of her already, and Laura tells her that she should have taken Gabby. If Gabby is willing to stay, this should be her home. I might attract a spontaneous Galactus attack, and he might step on her sandwiches, though. Gabby is obviously confused by that one, and Laura tells her, Never mind. You belong here, and I won't leave you. Gabby is currently in their apartment playing with Jonathan, a pet Wolverine that she picked up. She smiles as she puts a mask on his face, telling him that they need to hide his identity. And then there's a shriek from Laura's bedroom, and Gabby goes to check it out, finding Laura in full costume, telling her to stay back. She leaps out the window, putting her fingers into the pose to whip a web line, but of course she doesn't have web shooters and belly flops onto the roof of a car. Gabby rushes down in her pajamas, asking Laura, what was that all about? And Laura turns to her, who's Laura? I'm Gwen Stacy. 
Meanwhile, on Earth-65, Gwen Stacy, who was also known as Spider-Woman on this Earth, suddenly forgot how to play the drums while on stage with her band. The Mary Janes all look at her like, what are you doing? And she tries to slam down the drumsticks only to put her hands through the drum, because Gwen Stacy has super strength. Mary Jane asks her for the drumsticks, and then she realizes that she can't get them off of her sticky hands, and she just takes off of the door. She runs outside to find her father waiting for her, and when she gets into the car, she shuts the door so hard that she breaks the glass. Super confused, her father brings her home and an aircraft lands in their backyard. A kid walks out telling them, my name is Reed Richards, and then he walks in telling her father that he's um friends with Gwen, and he whispers to her, you might want to get your spider woman suit, which is upstairs. Confused as always, she goes up grabbing the suit, and then Reed takes off into the skies and explains everything that is going on. Gwen Stacy is from Earth-65, and Laura Kinney is from Marvel Prime, and they've body swamped across dimensions. The big problem is that in three hours, the body swamp will reverse, and since they are currently occupying each other's bodies, they'll have nowhere to go and poof, they'll be gone. So what they need to do is find each other and then find a way to swap back within three hours. Luckily, Reed is super smart and he can teleport her back to Marvel Prime. Meanwhile, back at the apartment with Gabby and Laura, Laura is trying to explain that she isn't who Gabby thinks she is. She's actually a girl named Gwen Stacy. Gabby explains that it's not that she doesn't believe her, but, well, she took a pretty big hit to her head. Her brain might still be healing. Then there's a knock at the door and Gwen walks in and both of them know exactly what this means. Now, for the sake of not confusing anybody even further because it's already going to be confusing, we're going to keep calling everyone by the body that they're in. So, the person in Gwen's body will be calling Gwen and the person in Laura's body will be calling Laura. Hopefully, that makes it less confusing. They realize that they have body swamped and Gwen explains to Laura that they have to swamp back within three hours or this is permanent. It, or they're going to die. So Gwen asks Laura to come to the window where she was hit with a blast and look across. She sees what looks like a gun and she tells Gwen to swing over there since she has web shooters that allow her to swing around. But Gwen isn't stupid. Let me guess. I'll try and then I'll fall and I'll hurt myself. So I'm gonna walk. Laura agrees, telling her that maybe it's best that she doesn't break her body before she gets back into it. On the other side of the street, Gwen kicks in the door and asks Laura, How strong are you? And Laura tells her, I broke a lot of treasured things before I figured that out. Inside, they find the gun, which is now broken by the door that Gwen kicked in. And then Laura picks up the scent of the person who used it. She keeps sniffing the air, and then she mentions how dumb she feels sniffing the air. But Gwen assures her, You're unkillable with metal claws that pop out of your hands and feet. Don't worry, you're not dumb. This, of course, is a reason to pause for Laura. Wait, I have claws in my feet and fists? Does it hurt? Have you ever had a paper cut on the webbing of your hands and feet? No, that sounds terrible! Well, this is knives coming out of them. Okay, I'm not doing that. Laura points to a basement where Gwen tears the doors off of it and they step inside. And then Gwen stops as the alarms are going off in her head. And Laura tells her that that's spider sense! A flamethrower bursts out of the ground and it begins to try and roast them. Gwen grabs Laura and tries to shield her from the fire, but Laura wants to know what is she doing? Trying to save you. Well, don't! You're body heals, mine doesn't. That's a very good point, Gwen tells her. That's when someone in a flying hornet suit arrives in front of them, demanding to know why they're here. She swoops in, opening fire on them, so Laura tells Gwen to use her webs, and Gwen takes aim and hits the ceiling. The flying robot person then opens fire on them again, so Laura grabs Gwen, getting her out of the path of destruction. Then Gwen thwips onto the hornet, pulling them down, and the hornet blasts Gwen into the wall. Thinking her body's been killed, Laura turns to the person, demanding to know who she is and why is she doing this. She begins to angrily shake her fist in front of her face, and Gwen tries to to tell her to stop, but it's too late. With that anger, Laura pops her claws into her own head, dropping herself. The robot girl lands and pulls her helmet off, deciding that she's gonna be sick, watching someone stab themselves in the head. Gwen walks over, demanding to know what's going on, and the woman explains that she fired her beam into Wolverine's apartment to get him. You know, the short and hairy guy? So who is the girl on the ground, and who are you? Gwen explains that her, well, the real her, is the new Wolverine. Logan was killed, and she is his daughter. The mystery woman is surprised. She had no idea. She's been living in this basement, living off ramen noodles for years. All to build the teleporter to send Wolverine away. She couldn't kill him. She just wanted him gone. Gwen walks over and retracts the claws from Laura's head so that she can heal, and Gwen asks the mystery woman why she wanted to send him away. And as it turns out, her uncle was the original Hornet, and Logan killed him. While she explains, Laura wakes up curious as to what actually happened. And since none of this is what Hornet wanted, she agrees to help them both get into their right spots in their own universes in the right bodies. Gwen walks over and she waves goodbye as Hornet warps her away. And then Laura goes to the same spot and is put back in her body. And Hornet says, Hi! I'm Melinda, and Laura tells her her name. Laura then begins to talk about what's next and asks Melinda if she'd like to work with her. She's not gonna hold an urge for revenge against her because that's kind of what her entire family's about. And then with a flush, Melinda teleports Laura back to her apartment where Gabby and Jonathan are cheerful that she's returned.
A hundred miles off of New Jersey, two boats meet to trade off an interesting box, an exchange that S.H.I.E.L.D. has been tracking for a while, and they arrive to secure that box. But when you box a criminal in who has a secret weapon, they do what you think they would do, and she opens the box, revealing its contents to be an odor, a single smell. Back in the home of Laura, her phone goes off as Maria Hill calls her to let her know about the situation. Laura turns her down, stating that she won't be involved in any S.H.I.E.L.D. situations. But Maria is slightly insistent. She kind of needs Wolverine's help. She even paid for the noodles, that they were having delivered. As Laura reluctantly goes to the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier to find out what Maria Hill wants, Maria shows her the box and asks her what the odor is. Laura sniffs it and says that it's something familiar, but she isn't quite sure. And that's when Maria explains that the other reason she called out to Laura, because that's what he said, the other Logan, the future Logan. Gabby sees the future Logan on the screen and asks if that's Laura's dad. Laura tells her no. That's someone from another dimension or something. It's not Logan. She asks where he went after he got the scent, and Maria explains that he left and told them not to track him. But Laura's not dumb, and she knows that Maria wouldn't listen to that, so she tells her to bring Laura and Gabby to the location that they're tracking him at. And as they arrive, no one can figure out what's going on since it's over the ocean. So Maria Hill has the box opened entirely, and inside they find a liquid. That's when it hits Laura. The box doesn't contain a weapon, it's a scent. A scent to attract Fing Fang Foom. But everyone figured that out as Fing Fang Foom rose out of the water, smashing the helicarrier. Laura figures this out all too fast. Maria, watch Gabby, I might not get another chance at this. Maria asks her where she's going, and she responds with, I know where the old man is, and she runs off the helicarrier, leaping into the mouth of the creature. Over the ocean, Iron Man rockets in, calling up Maria. Hill, I couldn't help but notice your helicarrier is under attack by a hundred foot tall monster in my city. He then flies in, blasting it in the face, but Maria tells him to stop. Wolverine is inside of there, and that's when Captain Marvel arrives to uppercut Fing Fang Foom in the face. But inside of this beast, Laura slides down into its stomach acid, calling out for Logan. Where are you, old man and he calls out over here kid the stomach acids have eaten through my legs so she pops all of her claws grabbing him and begins to crawl out of the throat of fing fang foo meanwhile fing fang hits the helicarrier so hard that it begins to crash so iron man and captain marvel fly beneath it so that it doesn't crash too hard holding it back from hitting the water hard as they fall though maria notices gabby made a break for it it turns out she grabbed a rocket pack as she flew out to meet up with iron man and captain marvel iron man looks at the pint-sized girl and he asks maria if her agents are getting smart and a big grin forms on Gabby's face as she explains, I'm getting very mixed emotions right now. I'm flying around on a jetpack, meeting both Iron Man and Captain Marvel, and I really love your kick-assness and hair, Captain Marvel. She explains that her sister is inside of the raging hundred-foot-tall monster, and Captain Marvel is confused, asking who's her sister. And that's when we see Wolverine crawling out of the mouth of Fing Fang Foom, holding the old man. Gabby flies in to get Logan, and Laura dives into the ocean where the helicarrier is currently floating, and she crawls into the room where the scent spilled everywhere. She rubs it all over her clothes, and then tells them to get her a jetpack. She then flies outside, grabs Fing Fang Foom's attention with the scent being on top of her, and she drags him all the way out to the middle of the ocean. Once she gets back to her apartment, she then realizes that Gabby brought Logan there. Gabby explains that she literally only knows this place in a cell. Plus, isn't he Laura's dad? No, he isn't my dad. He's a twisted reminder of Logan. And then Gabby notices Laura is wearing a Captain Marvel shirt and asks about that. She explains that she had to throw her clothes into the ocean with the scent on them so Fing Fang Foom would follow those. And then, yes, she flew back naked. It was cold. But as they're talking... Logan wakes up and he mentions, I know this place, and then he looks to Laura. It's where I raised you. In the S.H.I.E.L.D. Helicarrier, our story begins with Ulysses receiving a vision that is going to change things. He sees old man Logan holding the dead body of Gabby. But forget that right now, because the old man just woke up to Jonathan, Gabby's pet Wolverine looking at him, and Gabby apologizing. He tries to sit up only to find himself tied down, demanding to know what's going on, and then wondering why he can hear whales. Gabby explains that Laura thought he might wake up confused, so she was playing a tape of whales to try and calm him down. I'm Gabby. I was cloned from Laura, who was cloned from you, so you're kind of like my interdimensional dystopian future grandfather. Laura then walks out of the other room asking how he feels, and the old man tells her, like it was hit in the gut by a giant beast. And Gabby wants to know if he was soothed by the whale song. Sure. But as they go to let the old man up, they hear footsteps coming to the door. Logan whips out his claws, and Laura tells him to stop. This is her home. Two burglars break into the window, and they see Laura, Gabby, and Logan all there. Gabby presses her hands together. Oh my god, are you burglars? And you broke into here? Both Laura and Logan begin to snicker, and then everyone begins to burst out laughing. This, of course, irritates our burglars as they demand to know what's funny, and Logan thanks them for the laugh. 
So they pull out a gun, pointing it at him, asking, Is this funny? Laura tells them to take this one chance and leave right now. But Jonathan runs forward, protecting his owners, and a gunshot goes off, hitting him in the stomach. Both Laura and Logan pop their claws, but it's Gabby who leaps in screaming. Laura then cuts the gun of the other man to pieces, throwing him into a wall, and Logan gets his claws to the man's throat. But Laura asked him not to kill, so Logan headbutts him. Gabby runs over to Jonathan, and they all discover that he was only grazed. So Logan and Gabby take him to the other room to patch him up. That's when Logan tells her. He knows that Gabby is hiding something. He knew her in his timeline. He looks her right in the eyes, and he asks her, Do you plan to hurt Laura? And Gabby snaps, No! You swear? I swear. Okay. Before, when you did that flying knee to the kid's face? Yeah? That's the kind of thing an interdimensional dystopian grandpa might be proud of. Logan walks back into the kitchen and he pops the top off of a grape juice with his claws. And he has a seat next to Laura. You've been here before, right? When you got here, you said that this is where you raised me. I knew that you were here, not in this apartment, but in this world. You were avoiding me? I screwed up so much. I hurt almost everyone but you. There wasn't one damn thing I regretted about you, kid. You were one of the only things I got right. But we need to talk about Gabby. No, this isn't your past. I don't care about destiny. I don't care about what happened in your world. She gets to live her own life and our Hours. Logan smiles. It's good to see you tell me off again, kid. The burglars begin to wake up, so Laura decides to call up Maria Hill of S.H.I.E.L.D. and have them hauled off. But Hill stops her. Laura, we have a team in route. Logan perks up because he can hear the sound of combat boots moving up the stairs. Listen carefully, Laura. I need you to stay calm. This isn't about you, it's about him. He's going to kill Gabby. Outside, Laura can see Captain America waiting to bring Logan in. Cap leaps up to the window and he walks in and Gabby comes running out of the room and sees him, saluting him right away. Oh my gosh, it's Captain freaking America. He explains to the group that Ulysses, the inhuman who can see the future, saw Logan killing a lot of people and someone close to him. Logan eyeballs him. What do you think, Steve? I think you should come with me until we feel the danger has passed. Laura gets in the way. Someone saw something in his head and you want to punish people for it? It's not a punishment, Laura. He'll have everything that he could ever want. Except his freedom. Everyone stands there eyeballing each other and Gabby stamps her foot down. This is so tense! Then over the radio in his ear, the soldiers report that Cap can stand aside so they can take the hostile out. Laura and Logan look at him. You know we have very good hearing, right? I wasn't feeling hostile until now. Whatever it is, isn't worth it. I'll get my stuff. And Logan walks into the other room, but the radio goes off again. Captain, he was in Fing Fang Foom's stomach yesterday. He doesn't have any stuff. Laura stands in Cap's way, so Steve slams her into a wall. The door gets kicked in and the soldiers open fire, while Laura leaps over Steve's shoulders and kicks the tranks away. Meanwhile, in the room without a window, Gabby explains that she'll protect Logan and pulls out two jetpacks. That explains that since there's no window, they have a little bit of a problem. Leave it to me, kid. He says smiling and he pulls out his claws. While Laura and Captain America fight it out, the old man and Gabby start tearing down the walls running through the other apartments until they make it to a window and they jump out. Captain America jumps out after them and prepares to throw his shield, but that's when a trank dart hits him in the back, and Laura is the one that took the shot. Shield isn't done though, as they use the helicarrier to blast Logan out of the sky, right next to Gabby. He crash lands into a fountain and he pops his claws, ready to go, growling. The guards all see it. Oh shit, fire! And they all begin to pump him full of tranquilizer. He begins tearing through them, burying his claws into their guts and screaming out. Gabby flies overhead seeing him and calling out to him, telling him to stop. Laura and Captain America both arrive at that moment, and Cap tells everyone to stand down as Gabby lands in front of Logan. Laura sees what's going on and she yells for Gabby to get back. She warns her that Logan has become feral, but she tells him it's going to be okay. Logan looks at her sad and confused, and he stabs her in the gut. You took her from me, he shouts. As Gabby hits the ground, he jumps over to Captain America, but Steve smacks him away with the shield, throwing Logan off of him. Laura runs over, unable to say anything except no, 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 and Captain America calls out for the medic. In the confusion, Logan dropped down into the sewers, and Laura tells him that she's going after him. Captain America tells her that he'll go with her, but she says no. You've done enough. Do you think he would have lashed out like that if you didn't pump him full of tranquilizers? Do you honestly think this prediction would have come true if you didn't attack him? Laura then looks at Gabby, dead in her arms. I told her. I said I wouldn't leave her. Keep her safe. And Laura hands Gabby's body over to Captain America before jumping into the sewers. But as she finds him, he turns growling at her. What are you? What did they do to you? You're not Logan. You're just some twisted perversion with his face. And he jumps at her. Laura throws his claws aside and lunges at him herself. But he dodges away easily, so she leaps over his back. As she's on his back, he lifts up, throwing her down. And they both get up, lunging at each other. Meanwhile, back on the surface, Captain America sadly places a sheet over Gabby's body. And 
She sits up, and she demands to know where Logan is. The medic tells her in the sewers, so she makes a break for it. Back in the sewers, Logan swings and Laura dodges until finally she gets a slash in across his gut. Blood begins to pour out of him and he finally begins to come to his senses. And he sees Laura coming in preparing to stab him, so he shouts, WAIT! And she tells him no. That's when Gabby grabs her hand. She turns and sees Gabby, and she's shocked. So Gabby shows her a claw, showing her that she now has Laura's powers. She's so sorry that she didn't tell Laura sooner. She turns back to Logan asking, Did you know? Did she have powers in your world? No, I didn't know for sure. You killed her, didn't you? In your world? No. You killed each other. You don't understand. She took you away. She's worse than both of us. It wasn't her. It's not her future. But I can see death on you. Tell me, was there anyone in your world who didn't die for knowing you? Stay away from her and stay away from us. Laura and Gabby turn to leave and Gabby turns back apologizing for what happened. Logan growls at her. You hurt her and I'll come for you. Fair enough. You bring a single ounce of pain into that perfect woman's life and I'll put you down like a rabid dog. Bye. They both crawl back out where Captain America and S.H.I.E.L.D. are waiting. Captain America tries to explain the Civil War II situation to Laura, but she doesn't want to hear it. As far as she's concerned, she's not in whatever is happening. In their New York apartment, Laurie and Gabby try to live a normal life after all of the things that they've been through. One of those days, Gabby comes back from the downstairs mailbox to find a package addressed to Laura with no return address. As she looks at the package, she says that this is why they're moving. Things in this area are no longer secure for them. They've had burglars, been invaded by S.H.I.E.L.D., and even Squirrel Girl showed up. And now a mystery package. As Laura opens the box, her eyes widen as she looks down at a small vial with the word Trigger written on it. She quickly throws the box telling Gabby to get her things and Jonathan, they're leaving now. After driving for most of the day, Gabby asks Laura if she can tell her where they're going. And Laura says they're headed to a cabin in California. It belonged to Logan and no one knows about it, so they have plenty of isolation there. Gabby says, you know, that's the start of a horror movie. You want undead hordes? Because this is how we get undead hordes. Gabby then asks, what about the other family? Isn't there some place they could go? And Laura says that she does have an aunt and a cousin, but she almost got them killed and it was because of what was in that package. She then explains that back when she was born, she was raised with the sole purpose of being a weapon. To guarantee it, there would be a trigger scent made. One smell of it and everything turns black. Once the light comes back on, everyone around her is dead. A cross-country trip later, Laura tells Gabby to wake up, they're finally here. She gets out of the car yawning, telling her, Okay, good. We should go deal with those soulless husks now. And as the two get into the cabin, Laura says that it may look bad, but they're gonna clean things up and get everything going. Even some internet. Gabby looks at the freezer and opens it to see a family of mice living in a hollowed-out loaf of bread. Laura says, that's weird. Logan had bread. And Gabby says that it kind of worries her since the mice chose to live here, it means that the freezer is probably the most livable place in the entire... But before she can finish her sentence, the lights go out and the whole cabin loses power. Laura flips on a flashlight and checks the breaker, stating that there's nothing wrong out there. She's gonna head into town and see if it's not just them. Gabby asks if she's really gonna leave here alone with the smell in the cabin. And Laura tells her no, she has Jonathan, a pelican statue, and a family of mice. After a short walk into town, Laura finds a son and father and learns that the outage isn't just her. But just as she asks what they think could be the problem, she begins to hear something. Something big. Like a few planes. The father says that he can't hear anything and Laura says that they are water bombers and they're emptying something. Suddenly the air begins to fill with green clouds and Laura quietly says that it's the trigger set. She shouts back to the son and father to run and as the son asks why would they, she tells them that she's sorry. She's sorry that she ever came here. And then with a snit, her claws come out and her eyes go blank. Just after 10 p.m., Nick and his response team are sent out to Dalesville to see why the town went dark. But by the time that they get there, the town was wiped out. One of the soldiers asks, what is it? And Nick calmly tells them that it was Wolverine. Laura looks back, telling them all that she's sorry, she's so sorry, and Agent Bennett runs up, hitting Laura with the end of her rifle, telling her to get on the ground. Another agent tells Bennett to relax. Does she really think that pissing off Wolverine is a good idea? And as Laura is brought aboard Nick's aircraft, Laura mentions that she didn't do this. Someone made her. They used planes. Nick radios back to Shield Command, asking if they have any planes on their radar, and the operative tells him affirmative. There are three water bombers heading out to sea. Nick tells them all right, patch him over to the fighters that are in their location. Once connected, the pilots report that they are in route and the bombers are in their sights. Nick says, good, just follow them. They need answers. So turn back once they land and the pilot stops him telling him, wait, there's something else, something big. It looks like the planes are flying straight into whatever it is. 
Nick shouts to the pilots to abort, but before the fighter jets can turn around, they're blown up in the sky. The operative on the radio reports that the warplane is heading back into the sea, but they did manage to see the flag on it. It's Madripoor. Bennett says that they can't follow them either. Madripoor is a sovereign nation, and if S.H.I.E.L.D. attacked, Melora stops them, telling them that they can't go. But Bennett punches Laura back in her seat, telling her to shut up. She then pulls out her wrists in front of her and cuts off the handcuffs, jumps up, kicking Bennett to the ground. Bennett sees Laura grab the rifle, and he tells her not to shoot. If she does, she'll breach the hull. And Laura tells her, fine, she's okay with that and she fires. An explosion goes off and the hull on the hull begins to suck everyone out. Nick shouts for Laura to get back and fires a few times into her. She then just runs and jumps out of the plane. The next morning, Laura returns to the cabin to begin packing and Gabby asks what's going on. Laura says they need to go. She just killed the townspeople and the answers as to why are in Madripoor. Gabby tells her, oh, Okay then, well I'm coming along too. And before you can tell me no, I am cloned from you, so I'm just as stubborn on that answer of no. Laura sighs and tells her fine, they're gonna travel by boat until they reach where they need to go. Later that night at the San Francisco docks, Gabby asks if it's an actual pirate ship. Can she say R? Also, can she get a wooden leg? Laura tells her that they're not those kind of pirates. And Gabby asks if she's sure because the woman behind them literally has an eye patch. Captain Ash tells Laura that she knows a lot of people are looking for her and S.H.I.E.L.D. was just here, so there would be a great amount of appreciation if they don't draw attention to each other. A woman tells Bologna that it seems that her little X-23 has escaped. Is she ready to face her sister? And Bologna tells her yes, she is ready. Back with Captain Ash and her ship, Ash tells everyone that they should be out of the worst of the storm. And as everyone begins to eat, Ash tells Laura that she's sorry to hear what happened to Logan. He was an above average lover. Gabby says, ew, and Ash says it's because of him that she is doing this for them. And Laura adds, also the money, and Ash tells her, well, and that. The following morning, Ash's ships begin to reach Madripoor, and as Laura and Gabby talk about Jonathan's seasickness, Laura begins to hear someone else talking. She heads over to Ash and asks, why is it that they parked so far from the port? And Ash says, well, they were just waiting for clearance on the harbor master, and Laura stops her, telling her, sure, you heard what you were transporting. Laura begins to feel a rush of pain as Ash pulls her gun back from her, shooting her in the stomach, and then the sounds of helicopters can be heard. Ash says, right. She also sold her out, so they are coming for her. Laura struggles and begins to break free from the other crew members and charges at Ash as she continues to fire, but with a quick swipe, Ash looks down at where her hand used to be. Laura then kicks her over the edge of the ship, handless, and Gabby says, all right, that was really violent. Care to share what's going on? Laura stabs a container and opens it, and Gabby asks, why is there a container within a container? The second door opens up, and Gabby sees a group of children and tells them not to worry. The woman out there is a superhero. Laura looks back at the helicopters and says that she's pretty sure they don't want to meet whoever's inside of those, and then a man jumps out. As the giant man lands on the ship, Laura says that it's roughhouse. But before he can do anything, Bologna jumps down on a rope onto the ship, telling him to leave them. She'll take care of this. Laura tells her that this isn't going to happen, and Bologna says maybe she can win this. Maybe she can even kill them all. And maybe the kids will become some collateral damage. Does she really want to risk that? Bologna then takes out a pair of special cuffs, attaching them to Laura, asking where's the captain. A few moments later, after after being pulled out of the water, Ash shouts for someone to find her hand, and Bologna tells her that she'll be turning the ship around and bringing those children home. Ash tells her, yeah, that isn't happening, she has a reputation to, and Bologna shoots Ash down and asks who's the second in command. One of the crew members says, uh, and Bologna asks if she values her reputation more than her life, and the woman tells her absolutely not. Bologna then points to Roughhouse, saying that her friend over there will watch them and make sure that they do the right thing, and then she whispers to Roughhouse to kill every slave trader once the children are safe. As Bologna leads Laura to the helicopter, Gabby runs after her, telling her to stop, and Bologna covers her mouth, telling Roughhouse to put this one with the other kids. A short while later, as Laura begins to open up her eyes, she hears Kamara's voice telling her that she is so glad to have her little murder machine back. And now it's time to get to work. As Laura begins to open up her eyes again, she can feel herself hooked up to several machines, and Kamara pulls off the mask, telling her that she's a weapon. She's her weapon. And right now, they have their first target. A screen lights up, and Kamara points to it, stating that this is Tiger Tiger. Laura then asks how long did she spend on her villainous presentations? And Kamara laughs, telling her that Bologna will bring her to the window. Kamara goes on telling her that Madripoor is a golden gateway where the free market and black market come together. This is also the place where the empire will be born, and the only thing that stands in her way of her empire is Tiger Tiger. Back at Ash's ship, Gabby tells the other kids that she's sorry, but she's gonna have to leave them now. And one of the girls asks if it's because they took her sister. Gabby says, yeah, she never called her that, but that works. Gabby then says that she's going to need some help from them. So first up, she just needs them to know that she does not feel pain. And second, please don't freak out. And finally, you need to absolutely freak out. 
As Roughhouse watches over the kids, they suddenly hear the kids screaming and the girl from before says that Gabby fell and another one says that her bones are on the outside. Roughhouse picks up Gabby saying that they're going to go to the infirmary and Gabby gives the kids a thumbs up before leaving. A short while later over at the infirmary, another man recovering tells the nurse that that's gross. Her bones are on the outside. And then the nurse and the man hear a cracking and a popping sound. Gabby smiles as she puts her arm back in place and pops out a claw asking the nurse if she happens to have a satellite phone because she's gonna need to make a quick call. One week later, Laura is transported to her target location and a helicopter flies through releasing her canister into a building. The canister crashes into the ground and skids across it. And as soon as the latches open up, Laura jumps out sniffing the air. Down the hall, the soldiers all run into Tiger's office telling her that they need to leave immediately. But as the soldiers lead Tiger out, they see Laura standing there with their claws out. Before they can fire, she runs along the wall and knocks out the first two that were mentioned. As the second set fire their tasers, Laura grabs the cables that shoot by and then slams the hooks into the men. Tiger says that she doesn't know what this is, but before she can finish, Laura kicks and knocking Tiger's head off of her shoulders. A second Tiger walks out stating, well, and then the rolling head begins to short out. Laura charges at the real Tiger, but before she can stab her, Gabby appears grabbing onto her, telling Tiger to get back outside. As Gabby struggles to stay on, she tells Laura that this is going to hurt, like, a lot and Gambit's voice tells her it's true and then he charges up a card throwing it leveling the entire floor later Laura's eyes begin to open up again and she sees Gabby holding a rabbit and Gabby tells her okay don't freak out Laura shoots up asking how many how many people did Kamara make her kill Angel puts his hand on Laura's shoulder and tells her none she just cut the head off of a life model decoy and those other people well they're mostly okay Gambit says that's right before you could kill Tiger he blew her up and Angel says afterwards he flew all of the pieces of her here and please promise him that he won't have to do something like that ever again. Laura then asks, where are they? And Angel says, at Tiger Tiger's safe house, which is practically impenetrable, and they figured that this would be a good place for her to heal. Gabby holds up a vial of the trigger scent and adds that it will also help with this. Laura stumbles back trying to get away from it, and Gabby goes on telling them that they also have the help of the world's most powerful telepath. And Jean Grey walks out waving. Laura asks what she's doing here, and Jean says essentially they'll be doing some intense mind training, and she needs to have the full support of Laura if they're going to go through with this. Gambit heads out and says that him and Angel will guard the outside of the bunker and Jean says that that will be good. She's gonna need complete concentration. No interruptions. Laura looks at Angel and tells him that this is a bad idea and Angel tells her that she's got this. She's Wolverine. She can kick the ass of anything. Laura then turns back to the rabbit and says that this is crazy. She's going to kill the rabbit. And Gabby says that, that comes later. She will be first. As Jean leaves and the door is shut, Gabby takes out the vial and says that it's okay. She can't feel pain and she can heal. And she loves her and then she drops the vial scent onto her skin. Laura's eyes change and she lunges forward and as her and Gabby begin to fight, Jean taps into Laura's mind. Jean starts to see the room change and it goes back to when Laura was younger and her mother would read her stories. But while that goes on, Angel says that someone is coming and it's not Kamara, it's S.H.I.E.L.D. Angel flies onto Nick's ship telling everyone that he doesn't want to hurt anyone. He just wants to talk. Nick pulls out his gun and says, fine, they can talk. Angel asks how is it that they found them and Tiger speaks for him stating that she was the one. Though they did save her, they can understand her not feeling overly beholden to Wolverine, right? If Magipore is going to become an international community, then working with S.H.I.E.L.D. would be their first step. There's a sudden beep and the pilot says that they've been locked on by a missile. And Bennett asks, was it him? Angel answers her by asking why would he fire a missile at himself? Outside, Kamara's warplane fires missiles, and Nick tells everyone to jump. As the plane is hit, Angel runs to the cockpit, grabbing Nick and the pilot, and he manages to escape just as it explodes. Back with Jean, she tells the younger Laura that she can understand why she would come here. It's a beautiful memory. She's sorry that she's about to take it away from her. Laura tells her that she can't leave, the door is locked, and she should be going away now. Jean says that it is safe outside, no one can hurt her. She can be the one in control. The young Laura grows and stabs into Jean, telling her that she should go. But Jean continues stating that she is not X-23. She is more than a letter and a number. She has a name, and it's Laura Kinney, and she was born. She is the superhero Wolverine. Just look. The image of Jean begins to fade, and it's replaced by Gabby. She asks Laura if she's there. As Angel brings everyone back to Tiger's safe house, Gambit shouts out that they can't interrupt Jean. Jean opens the door, telling them, actually, they're not interrupting anything. Laura's petting the rabbit, telling everyone that it's okay. They can hide here. Nick stares at the rabbit and asks, what's with the bunny? Laura tells him it's okay, she's free now, it's safe. As the bunker locks behind them, Kamara walks up to the entrance telling everyone inside that she just wants X-23 and Tiger. If they are turned over, then everyone lives and she would much rather not quarrel with S.H.I.E.L.D. Nick shouts that she just killed some of his people. He's going to quarrel the absolute shit out of her. Nick then looks back and says that that woman who tortured her and forced her to kill everyone in Daysdale? Bennett then says, even still, she has to pay for her crimes. 
Laura tells them that she understands, and after she deals with Kamara, she'll come with them. But as Laura begins to walk towards the exit, Gambit tells her that she doesn't have to do this alone, and Angel adds that honestly, they kind of wouldn't let her anyway. Laura then asks Tiger if there's anything in this bunker that can help them. Tiger reaches over the wall, telling them that there is something. A hidden door opens up with an Iron Man suit. Tiger says, please don't tell Tony that she has this. It was an early prototype that she got off of the black market and she's going to return it, really. A short while later, everyone begins to exit the bunker with their hands up and Roughhouse looks at Gambit asking, why is he carrying a can of beans? Gambit smiles and he charges the can, throwing it into the war plane, creating a massive explosion of Frankenbeans. Okay, there was no Frankenbeans. I had to add Frankenbeans. It makes more sense. It's funnier. Anyway, as he watches, Gambit says, damn, he might have to start carrying beans from now on. Gene then grabs everyone and helps them aboard the warplane. Gambit then throws a card at some of the oncoming soldiers, and before it can go off, Roughhouse catches it and crumples it up. Gambit radios to Laura that they're here, and she responds, telling them that she's on her way. Seconds later, she comes shooting out, wearing the Iron Man suit, and Angel tells her that she does know it has a helmet, right? Because she's not wearing the helmet. Laura tells her, yeah, but she can't hear or smell in it. Plus, she wanted to see Kamara's face when she finishes her. Kamara laughs, telling her that she's just gonna make her kill her friends again, then her aunt and cousin, and she tosses the trigger at everyone. Everyone stands there for a moment, and Laura asks, how is that working for you? Jean's eyes begin to light up and Kamara shouts that those powers won't work on her. And Jean asks, why would she want to control her? Roughhouse's eyes begin to glow and he swings back, knocking Kamara into the warplane. Laura and Angel begin to quickly chase after her and as she falls, Kamara shoots back up, hitting Angel in the shoulder. Back in the warplane, Jean uses Roughhouse to stop Malona from shooting them. And as she's knocked down, her mask comes off. Gabby runs up asking what did they do and Malona says that Kamara saved her from the imprisonment and the nanites that are killing her. Gabby asks if this is really saving her. She's a slave to Kamara's will. Kamara is just using her as a guinea pig, and Bologna says that this was either going to happen to herself or to Gabby, and she couldn't let Kamara's people get to Gabby. Bologna then looks up at Nick and tells him that Wolverine didn't kill those people in Daysville. When the scent dropped, Laura stabbed herself in her own brain. Gabby then asks how were the people killed, and Bologna pops her claw, stating that she was the contingency plan. Back outside, Laura pulls Angel from the waters, and as she rubs her head, Angel coughs, asking, are you petting my head? Laura asks him, is it awkward? And Angel says, just a little, but don't stop. As Laura smiles, Kamara punches her in the back of the head. Angel blasts Kamara back, and as she gets up, Kamara tells Laura that it's pointless. There's no way that she can hurt her. Laura rockets off with the suit into Kamara, telling her that she might be unbreakable, but she still needs to breathe. Laura holds Kamara's head underwater, shouting that she is not X-23. She is not her experiment. She is not her f property. Kamara crawls onto Laura's face and she goes on shouting that she is not a thing. She is the daughter of Sarah, the daughter of Logan. She is Wolverine. And as the claws come out, the prototype Iron Man suit shatters and Laura hears something behind her. Bologna holds up her hands telling her that it's okay. It's done. Just look after Gabby for her. Laura asks what's going on and Nick tells her that it's over. She's free now. A week later, Laura knocks on a door and her aunt Debbie answers. She asks what she's doing here. Laura tells her that it's okay. Kamara's gone, they are safe. They don't have to hide anymore. In the quiet apartment of Laura and Gabby Kinney, there's a scream as Pentagon the Pelican loses a leg. Gabby looks at Jonathan the Wolverine as he's chewing through the broken leg of the statue, asking, how could you? Laura comes in holding a leash, telling Gabby that her pet Wolverine just ate through a statue. It's probably time to take him for a walk. Gabby says maybe he doesn't need one. And Laura says if only they had some kind of universal translator so that he could tell them, oh wait, they do. After tying the small device around Jonathan's neck, Jonathan tells them, need outside, sunshine, air, taste of other bird statues. And a short while later, Gabby is out walking Jonathan. It's not long into their walk that Jonathan begins to smell something, and he immediately begins to growl and pull at the leash. Gabby tries to control him, but Jonathan just starts running full force, dragging Gabby behind him. Once he finally stops, he begins to growl towards a building with two armed guards sitting outside. Gabby looks at the building and asks, what is this place? And he simply says, bad place, hurt Jonathan, hurt family. So Gabby calls the one person that she knows who can help in this kind of a situation, Deadpool. Wade picks up the phone telling her, hi kiddo, and Gabby asks if it's a bad time. Wade, who was in the middle of stabbing someone, tells her, oh no, 
I'm not doing anything important. Gabby tells him good, there's something that she was hoping that he could help her with. Wade asks, this isn't something Wolverine can help with, is it? Is it unethical? Is it illegal? Gabby says that she's not sure Laura would help with this, so it's probably unethical. And it's definitely illegal. Wade tosses the body off his sword and he tells her, all right, I'll be right there. Once Wade gets to where Gabby is, he looks at Jonathan and it says, oh my God, he talks. Who's a sweetie little snookums? And as Wade extends his hand to pet Jonathan, Jonathan snaps at him, telling him, we'll eat face off. Gabby yells at Jonathan and Wade tells her, no, no, it's okay. We've established some boundaries, that's all. And uh, what is this place anyway? Gabby then says that Jonathan was rescued from a lab and she's pretty sure that this is the one that he was experimented on. Wade tells her, so you wanna burn it down? And Gabby yells, hell no, I wanna save the animals. Wade tells her, oh, of course, and then burn it down? And Gabby tells him, they'll cross that bridge when they get to it and they'll probably burn it down. A few moments later, Gabby walks up to the guards and says, Hello, I'm not sure where this sentence is going, but it's okay. I'm only here to confuse and disarm you. The men stare at Gabby and then Wade reaches from behind, holding a cloth over the two men's faces. Gabby asks, Do you always carry chloroform? And Wade tells her, Of course. In fact, I'd like to give you this bottle. How irresponsible would I be if I let you walk around without a means of knocking anyone out? Now it's time to suit up and get to business. After Gabby gets her honey badger costume on, Wade and her just walk right in and his security guard yells, hey, you can't be in here. Gabby quickly takes out a cloth with chloroform, putting it on the guard's mask, telling him, shh. The guard falls backwards, hitting his head, and Gabby asks if she was supposed to catch him. And Wade tells her, yeah, but it's your first chloroforming. Don't stress about it. As Wade goes behind the counter, he looks at the computers and he says that the first few floors are full of animals, and he can open them all up from here. How convenient. Gabby then begins to walk towards the testing room, and Wade tells her, hang on a second. You need to prepare yourself for what you're about to see. These animals could have makeup on. Wade pushes open the door and sees a pack of zombie rabbits and squirrels and says, well, they are not spraying perfume in their eyes. But this also means that they have done something else. They've reanimated the dead. Gabby looks at the animals and says that those are monsters. They made zombies cute. Wade then says that he's not sure how to handle this situation. He's had dreams like this before. And Gabby tells him that they're already dead. They have to destroy them. So she pops her claws and yells, I'm really sorry about this, but we're going to put you out of your misery. Come hippity hop to your doom. After cutting up a pack of zombie animals, the two head down the hallway and they see a zombie sloth. Wade shouts, whoa, we have to be careful with this one. And they stand there and they wait and they wait and they wait. And Wade simply says, okay, this one might be a little while before it becomes an actual threat. Uh, you want something from this vending machine? Gabby yells, vengeance! And Wade tells her, they're all out of vengeance. How about a soda? And Gabby tells him that soda will do for now. But as the zombie animal killing continues, Laura sniffs the area and walks into the front door asking, Is that Deadpool? Wade spins around, surprised, with eight squirrels skewered on his swords, and yells, This is not what it looks like! Laura tells him that it looks like he just made squirrel kebabs, and Wade tells her, Okay, that's actually right. Gabby then runs up asking Laura how did she find him, and Laura tells her that she only went four blocks. Plus she's Wolverine. Now tell her why she passed a half-dead sloth back there. Gabby then says that this is the place where Jonathan was kept. They've done terrible things to the animals here. She didn't say anything because she thought that she would get mad and stop her. Laura smiles, putting her hand on Gabby's shoulder, telling her that she should have called. She would have come, and now she's here, so how about they finish this? Just then, one of the scientists runs out of a door with a shotgun, yelling for everyone to get on the floor. Wade looks at the man and laughs and tells him, Look at you! You think you're an actual threat! That's just the cutest little thing that I've ever seen. Laura walks up and says that she'll take it that he's the one responsible for all of these abominations. The scientist yells, of course I am! They all tried to stop me and... Wade looks at the door that the scientist came from and reads the words, the pit, spray painted across it and asks, what is this? The scientist tells Wade not to go in, but Wade, being Wade, opens it up. Inside is a pit filled with some more zombie animals and Jonathan says, family. Laura looks around and sees that there's no computers or cameras anywhere. This whole thing is for sport. The scientist points his gun at Jonathan, telling him to step back, and Laura swipes her claws, cutting the shotgun in half. Jonathan begins to growl an inch towards the scientist, and as he steps back, he ends up falling into the pit with the zombie wolverines. While the scientist is being eaten alive, Wade begins stacking barrels, and Jonathan says, Leave now. Hungry. Eat bird statue. Wade then kneels down with Gabby and holds out a gas can at a lighter, asking, Would you like to do the honors? Moments later, the three leave as the building bursts into flames, and Wade says that badasses walk away from a fire and can't look back. But we should probably watch it burn. Gabby shouts, oh hell yes we should. And they all sit down with Jonathan stating, old family gone, new family here. Wade begins petting Jonathan and says, "Oh, he's just a big softy, isn't it? And Jonathan tells him, we'll eat piece of you while you sleep. As everyone watches the building burn, Gabby says, wow, catharsis is really pretty.
And there you have it, another full story completed. Now, as much as I love Logan, I also love Old Man Logan, and I also love X-23, and I also love Honey Badger. I love all the Logan stuff. I'm a Wolverine fan. I don't care if he's an X-Men and I hate the X-Men. He's not really an X-Men. He's also an Avenger, so I'm gonna count that. I'm gonna be like, what, Wolverine's an Avenger, and I like that, because the mutant thing's kinda weird, and they all got weird political storylines, so I'm not gonna do that. We're not doing X-Men, we're doing Avengers. Avenger Wolverine, he's so cool. And now that he's back with the return to Wolverine, what do you think about that? Anybody who's watched the full story knows that normally at the end of these like two, three, one, 45 minute, I don't know how long this one was, uh, at the end of these long full stories, I just let myself ramble and my brain go in places that it is. And you know what? I'm really hungry. Chipotle is being delivered right now and I can't wait to go eat that, have some chips. You know they got a queso over there? The queso is not as good as Cadoba though. The Cadoba queso is better. But the but but the, the Chipotle one, it like suffices. So we're having that and I'm gonna have like a burrito bowl if you, okay, so what do you think about the return to Wolverine? And if you were putting your order into Chipotle, what would you order? Okay, and then the next time we do a full story, I'll order all of you Chipotle. Just, it's gonna be in the mail, so it might be like stale and bad. And if you're international and I'm sending you like a bowl from Chipotle, do you even know what Chipotle is? Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Chipotle is like rice and you put a meat on top. <laughs>